begin with our lecture for conservative dentistry discussing the 200 MCQs that you all appeared for and clearing the doubts. Let me first begin with introducing myself to you My graduation was from Government Dental College and Hospital whereas my post graduation happened in Maulana Azad Institute of Dental Sciences, New Delhi for which I had appeared for three sets of exams. One was All India in 2010, for which I stood third. Then I gave Maharashtra CET 2010, for which I came first. And then, of course, Comet was given by me, for which 10th rank was achieved. Presently, I am an assistant professor in the Department of Conservative Dentistry and Endodontics in Government Dental College and Hospital, Bombay. I'm sure most of you all have started your preparations. And if not, I think it's high time that you all begin with your preparations. These competitive exams are definitely way different than what you've been appearing till all these four years of your BDS. You have to be very thorough. You have to be alert. It's like you have to be nothing but the best if you want to secure a good rank and a good position in these competitive exams. And it's never too late to begin. Definitely not in this month if you all are appearing for All India 2015. Now, when I talk about the material that you have to study, definitely there are these five books, your Dental Pulse, the Gauri Shankar, your NBD, and the two medical books that is Amit Ashish and Modi Khanna, Modit Khanna. These multiple choice question books are something which is to be known by heart, each and every line, each and every page, each and every synopsis. At the same time, when you are attached to a test series or a classes, it will help you to orient yourself as to at what level are you performing, how much more do you need to put in your effort, and if it's going really well, if you're securing good rank, you need to maintain it at that level. Throughout, there's something called as perseverance. You have to remain dedicated to your cause. As many exams that will come throughout this year, attempt all of them. If you win, that's a good one. If you do not, do not get discouraged. It's all upon hard, luck, hard work as well as your luck. So ensure that you are giving your best at each and every step while studying, while preparing, while giving your exams and success will follow. All right, so with this, on this note, I shall begin with the questions discussion for today's paper on conservative, which included dental materials as well. If there's anything, what my aim would be for a particular question, I would like to explain you all the theory that is related to it because until and unless few concepts are not clear, any amount of question which is twisted and turned upon a particular text, you will not be able to answer. So, if a question is given in this particular paper, it can be asked in the other way around also in your exam. You need to have a good knowledge, very clear concepts about few things when it comes to operative or conservative dentistry. Questions are generally repetitive. They have a very direct meaning to it and you need to have a very direct knowledge about it. There should not be any confusion. So my aim would be to highlight few things about the theory that is related to this question which is asked in your paper. And if there's anything else beyond this which you all would like to know or you want an open discussion and on this forum, you can please keep posting your comments and I shall discuss it 
school. Shall I begin with the lecture? Yes? Now as and when the slides begin, I have not written the answers on the slides. So students who are online right now, if you all want to still attempt giving the right answer, please post your answer so that we can have, you can still get a chance of thinking and getting the right answer. Alright, so the first question was conventional cavity preparation is related to all of the following restorations except and the four options are amalgam, composite, gold and ceramic. So what according to you all is the answer to it? Yes. A very simple question with a very simple answer that is composite but this question itself can be asked in multiple ways. What I would prefer you all is to have a paper and a pen with you because I will be giving you all very definite numerical values and definite answers or uh, definite um, points which you have to know it at the tip of your tongue. There is no exception to those numerics or to those rules. So please keep a pen and a paper with your hand and as and when I give you all some numeric or when I tell you all highlight a few things, please keep noting it down. If you think I'm going a little faster, you can even post it that I'll, I'll slow my speed but ensure that you all are writing these points because conservative dentistry, most of the questions are in terms of numerical value or very definite questions are asked with a definite answer. So please write down whichever points I tell you all. So when I talk about cavity preparation, you have to know that whenever they ask you the size and shape of the cavity, whichever, whether it is amalgam, whether it is cast gold, whether it is ceramic, the first thing, the most commonly asked question will be that the depth of the cavity inside the DEJ. So it should always be that the depth of your cavity, whether for amalgam or whether for cast gold, it should always be 0.2 mm inside the DEJ. 0.2 mm inside the DEJ, dentino enamel junction. The only exception to this is with composite because they have micromechanical retention. They do not require the, the, the cavity shape proper for their mechanical retention. It will be depending upon the micromechanical bonding. When you talk about retention for amalgam and for gold, amalgam the primary retention will be through its occlusally converging walls and the dovetail. Whereas with cast gold, the primary retention feature will be through the surface area of the wall. That is in terms of its parallelism, in terms of its length, and also the ducting. So primary retention with the cavity, uh, conventional cavity preparation which is done for amalgam is through occlusally converging walls and the occlusal ductiles. For cast gold, it is through the parallelism of the walls, through the length of those walls as well as through the ductiles. So it's the frictional resistance between the restoration and the walls which will allow for the retention. Whereas for composites, it is only by micromechanical bonding. It does not depend upon a perfect shape and size and depth for it. So I was saying is that whenever they ask you the depth of a cavity or the extension of a cavity inside the DEJ, for any restoration, amalgam or cast gold to be very precise, it should be 0.2 mm inside the DEJ. If the question says that secondary retention is required, then it should be 0.5 mm in, inside the DEJ because the retention locks or the grooves that will be given will be in a depth of 0.5 millimeter. So if it's the 
primary retention or if they are simply just saying that the depth should be how much inside the DHA, it should always be 0.2 mm irrespective of whether it is amalgam or gold, cast gold. And if they are saying for a secondary retention, irrespective of what type of restoration it is, it should be 0.5 millimeters. Again, an exception to this third point to be noted is that if it is a restoration for direct filling gold, then the depth should be again 0.5 millimeter inside the DEJ. There, there is no question of primary or secondary retention feature. For a direct filling gold, the initial depth itself of the floor or the axial wall should be 0.5 millimeter inside the DEJ. So these are with your class 1, class 2 cavities. If I have to talk about class 5 cavities, class 5 cavities uh, shape or depth, then it should be in the range of 0.2 to 0.8 millimeters inside the DEJ. Okay. I repeat, for class 5, it should be 0.2 to 0.8 millimeters inside the DEJ. So when is 0.2 applicable and when is 0.8 applicable? 0.8 is applicable when your, the, the, the lower half of your cavity is extending onto the root surface. Because you do not have the enamel thickness or dentine thickness, you will have to give it some depth irrespective of whether the cavity is in dentine or how deep it is burn. But for the occlusal half, it should be again 0.2 mm inside the DEJ when you do not want to give any other secondary retention feature. So 0.2 to 0.8 millimeters. This rule which I have said about 0.2 to 0.8 millimeters is precisely for the smooth surface cavity. If I have to talk about if they ask you questions to be more precise about class 5, if they talk about smooth surface restoration, it should be 0.2 to 0.8 millimeters, 0.8 mm when the cavity extends onto the root surface. If they precisely mention that it's what is the cavity depth for a class 5 restoration, then the range changes to 0.75, the, the total depth of your cavity should be 0.8 millimeters to 1.25 millimeters. 0.8 millimeters to 1.25 millimeters. And in this situation, the depth of the axial wall will be 0.5 millimeters inside the DEJ. So the total depth which I have mentioned is 0.8 to 1.25 millimeters. And the depth of the axial wall measuring from the DEJ will be 0.5 millimeters. Again here, the 0.8 or 0.75 millimeters is for the root surface area. And the higher figure is for the occlusal half of the cavity. I'm repeating these entire figures. The initial depth for amalgam, oblique, cast gold, it should be 0.2 millimeter inside the DEJ. If there is any retentive feature is to be given for class 1 or class 2, precisely to for class 2, then it should be 0.5 millimeters inside the DEJ because that is how your retention locks and grooves will be placed. If it is a restoration of direct filling gold, then you have to place it as 0.5 millimeters inside the DEJ. If it is a, if they, if they ask about smooth surface restoration, whether on the proximal surface, whether on the labial facial surfaces or lingual surfaces, it will be again in the range of 0.2 to 0.8 millimeters. 0.8 is when it is extending onto the root surface. And lastly, for class 5 restoration, the initial axial depth from the DJ is 0.5 millimeters. The total depth can range between 0.8 or 0.75 as according to Studeven to 1.25 millimeters. I hope everybody's written all these figures. These you have to just 
remember them by heart all right few more things about the cavity preparation as and when there are few more questions that will come in due course i will also highlight those points for now you remember these depths and the various numbers coming on to the next question spread of caries along the dej and exceeding the caries in the contiguous enamel caries extend into the enamel from this junction and it is termed as what students can post your answer for the second mcq question backward caries correct for somebody who did not get the figures for class 5 i am repeating it is coin 8 when for the gingival area for the gingival depth and 1.25 mm for the occlusal depth to be more clear coin 8 mm on the gingival side because there may not be enamel thickness there and 1.25 for the occlusal part where there will be some thickness for the enamel and if the question says that how much should be the depth of the from the dej it should be 0.5 mm okay yes so the answer is backward caries now the options that are other options that are given you have to know very clear things about forward caries backward caries then pit and fissure smooth carry uh, pit and fissure carries then smooth surface carry then arrested carry acute carry chronic carry infected affected carry okay so there are there are few things that have to be remembered with each and every of these terminology now when i first start about pit and fissure carry so you have pit, pit and fissure and smooth surface caries when i talk about pit and fissure caries what will happen in these is you have to first remember that the area where the first demineralization happen or the anatomical structure where the deep uh, where the demineralization first happen is in the interprismatic enamel enamel which is composed of the prism or the rods or the crystals whatever you call it then you have the prism sheet around it and each of these prisms or rods or crystals are separated by interprismatic substance which is a cementing medium so you have the prism you have the prism sheet around it and you have the interprismatic substance so the first area where caries causes demineralization in in the area of enamel is in the interprismatic substance and thereby then it extends to cause the dissolution of the crystal so the caries cone if it is in the pit and fissure cave and i'm talking about the pit and fissure caries the caries cone in the enamel will become flared as it approaches the dej so the base of that cone will always be towards the dej so whenever your question says that the base of the cone for enamel caries in pit and fissure that will always be towards the dej okay so enamel pit and fissure carry the base of the cone is always towards the dej if the question says that the anatomy is enamel the type of carry is a smooth surface carry then the base of the cone will be towards the surface okay get this point very clear the base of the cone for smooth surface caries will be towards the surface because of the inclination of the enamel rod because of the amount of interprismatic substance which is present towards the surface of the enamel in the cervical region so pit and fissure caries and in the enamel 
the base of the cone will be towards the DEJ. That means the spread of the caries is faster towards the DEJ. From the from the neck of the fissure to the bottom of the fissure, the spread becomes faster along the DEJ. But for the smooth surface caries, the base of the cone is broader at the surface. That means the surface will be more highly demineralized or decomposed and the apex of the cone will be pointing towards the DEJ. When I talk about, when I come to the dentine, again the spread of the caries, whether it is pit or fissure or smooth surface, the maximum demineralization will be at the area of the DEJ. Okay. So, the base of caries cone in dentine will always be towards outside. That means towards the DEJ and the apex of the cone will be directed towards the pulp. And the first the, the first area which gets maximally demineralized will be the protoplasmic extensions that are present in the dentinal tubules. That means the first demineralization will always be present around the dentinal tubules or within the dentinal tubules where the protoplasmic extensions or the odontoplastic processes which we call it. So the first uh, anatomy which will show the areas of demineralization will be within the dentinal tubule or around the dentinal tubule in the protoplasmic extension. So I hope things are clear about the form of the caries and where exactly will the caries initiate. Now when I talk about forward caries and backward caries is forward caries is when your enamel is more caries or the caries cone in the enamel is more as compared to the dentine and backward caries is when the dentine has demineralized faster that means the caries cone in the dentine is broader as compared to that in the enamel. It is particularly seen when you have clinically in such a situation you see that the surface enamel is generally intact, it is opaque white, it is generally intact and on the underneath surface you will have brownish black discoloration. That's because in the underneath, uh, uh, underneath, that means below the enamel, dentine has completely mineralized and still enamel on the outer side has managed to retain its form. It's generally in the form of undermined enamel. Okay. Now apart from that, you have to also know the difference so we've uh, spoken about pit and fissure smooth caries, pit and fissure and smooth surface caries, then we've spoken about forward and backward caries. Then you need to know acute and chronic caries. Acute caries will be generally lighter in color because that is how the generally MCQs are mentioned. Acute caries which have rapid bacterial infiltration will be generally lighter in color because before any time could happen for massive bacterial infiltration, in acute caries there was basically no time for extrinsic pigmentation to happen. It was a very rapid form of a caries. Whereas in chronic caries generally they will be darker in color and they will be open cavitated lesions. So chronic caries, the two things to be remembered is that they are open cavitated lesions and they will be darker in color. Because of the chronicity, a lot of pigmentations have already happened. There will be zones of demineralization and demineralization that has occurred. So that is a form of chronic caries. Then if I talk about root caries, things to be remembered about root caries is that these will be generally shallower. They will be very commonly covered with a high layer of uh, thickness of plaque, there will be gingival recession and they are very rapid form of caries. So they are shallow caries, they will be having a thick layer of plaque covering it. They are rapid form of caries and if they are rapid as I said any caries which is rapid will be generally lighter in color 
because less time is given for deposition of any pigments or staining. However, they are capable of remineralization therapy. So we have spoken about rapid caries, uh, root surface caries, acute chronic caries. In a form of chronic caries, you can also mention the word ebonated dentine or arrested form of caries in which the area which has become self cleansable suppose uh, caries has happened on the proximal surface and the adjacent tooth was extracted or it lost due to some uh, decay or periodontal disease then that that area becomes accessible to the salivary buffers and that itself causes some remineralization so unless for cosmetic treatment these caries need not be treated arrested caries need not be treated unless it's for cosmetic treatment because they have self repaired themselves and it is called as ebonated dentine e b u r n a t e d that is a arrested form of caries all right now i have told you all about all the root caries if see there are there are a lot of factors to be known for the remineralization of root caries if it is heavily infiltrated with plaque pellicle there is poor oral hygiene then definitely because it's so rapid before any remineralization or before self repair has can occur it has already created so much destruction or cavitation that it may not self repair but another aspect too is that that because there is some amount of gingival recession to it and if the patient is given early recognition or if it is early diagnosed then oral hygiene maintenance therapy itself or fluoridated compounds itself can result in the remineralization of root surface caries so it's a double edged sword if it is given the proper treatment at early diagnosis then yes they can remineralize but if it is not if there is heavy infiltration of plaque then but of course nothing much can be done beyond this i think you all should write down the five zones of dentinal caries because that is very commonly asked because it's these five zones and the various separations between these zones have been very clearly uh, uh, noted down in students which are remineralizable which are not remineralizable so the most innermost zone of dentine is the normal dentine okay normal dentine that means it will be having its normal tubular appearance there will not be any crystals in the lumen that means there is no sclerosis there are normal intertubular dentine appearance normal uh, appearance of the collagen so it's a sound dentine normal dentine any cutting or any stimulation of a normal sound dentine without water coolant or too much of heavy pressure will stimulate some pain because of the receptors that are present so normal healthy dentine which has no bacterial invasion which has no demineralized zone that will be generally exhibiting sharp pain on an explorer or when you are doing dry cutting or on desiccation so that is first zone which is the normal dentine the second zone is the subtransparent dentine the things to be noted about subtransparent dentine is that it's an area where some demineralization has happened demineralization where in the intertubular dentine demineralization in the intertubular dentine some crystals have been formed in the tubule dentinal tubule because of why these crystals have been formed it's in the form of a healing process it's a self repair process so some irritation has occurred on the outer side so the odontoblast either the uh, the the parent odontoblast or the newly differentiated odontoblast they have resulted in the formation of some crystals within the tubule so there is some demineralization there is some crystal there is some sclerosis in the dentinal tubule but there is no bacterial invasion so this again zone is capable of remineralization though there is some demineralization it is again capable of remineralization so zone 2 can also remineralize 
जोन थ्री इज द ट्रांसपेरेंट डेंटी ट्रांसपेरेंट डेंटी अगेन इट इज अ जोन विच कैन बी रीमिनलाइज 